and we are entering the world of higher math, and we're going to stay there for the rest of the semester, all two weeks of it. Actually, yeah, two weeks. And then it's summer fun after final exams. All right, so we're going to talk about exponential functions. This is the graph of y equals 2 to the x. And we're going to be talking about that. Notice how it's constantly increasing. Exponential functions are like this. They start off, well, in their home position, they start off really close to the x-axis. That means that the y-coordinates are, are very, very small. And then they slowly grow up to where they cross the y-axis at 0, 1 one on the y-axis, and then they start growing really, really, really fast, which makes them a little inconvenient because they grow so fast that measuring becomes a real problem. So we use the inverse function to the exponential function a lot more often and you're familiar with it. That's how we measure the strength of hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes. And we're gonna talk more about that next week. But this week, we're going to talk about exponential functions. Let's see. Okay. Here's the graph of y equals 2 to the x on a graphing calculator. And here is the graph of y equals 2 to the negative x on the graphing calculator. They're mirror images of each other. But let's, let's look at some general things about exponential functions. All right, when your base, the two, that's called the base, two is called the base. Okay, when the base is a number greater than one, two is definitely greater than one, you have a shape like this. Okay, now notice this goes forever to the left and forever to the right. As it's going up, it also goes to the right. So the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. On the other hand, the range, whoop, the range is paren zero to infinity. And the reason for that is even though this graph gets closer and closer and closer to the x-axis here, and the x-axis is y equals zero, that's where the zero comes from. Um, this graph is never, uh, this line is never, the graph is never going to actually touch the x-axis, okay? The x-axis is actually an asymptote the asymptote, it's a horizontal asymptote. Okay. 
and the equation of the horizontal asymptote to an exponential function in its home position is y equals zero, the x-axis. This is a one-to-one -one function. Notice that if I draw a horizontal line through it, the horizontal line touches the graph at only one point. Therefore, this graph, this function, passes the HLT, the horizontal line test, which makes it a one-to-one -one function. So yes, it's one-to-one, -one, and not only that, it's increasing on its entire domain. That means it never turns around and goes down. It will never be decreasing. This graph is only increasing. Now, all of these things are true. This and this and this, these are true for this also. The graph goes forever to the left as it's going up and forever to the right. So its domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the x-axis, y equals zero, is actually, move this over a little, nah. Um, yeah, y equals zero is the x-axis. And this graph is going to come down and get closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but never touch it. You know, until you can't even tell the difference if you're looking through an electron microscope. So the range, we always go from the lowest to the highest. The range is from y equals zero up to infinity. But since the graph never actually touches the x-axis, we have a parenthesis zero to infinity. That means the x-axis here is the horizontal asymptote. And it's y equals zero, the x-axis. The only difference between this graph and this graph, this function and this function, is that when you view things as increasing or decreasing, you look from left to right, and this is decreasing on its entire domain. So, yeah, it's coming down from left to right never goes back up, just keeps going down forever and ever. This is the graph, if you're interested, a graph of population growth. This is the way populations grow if nothing happens to cut down on that population growth. It's the way humans, human population grows, the way the rabbit population grows, the way the bacterial population grows, all populations will grow exponentially um, unless something like a plague happens or a natural disaster that cuts down the population. This is the graph, a graph, of radioactive decay radioactive 
particles, well, we're going to talk about that more at, on the very last day, the very last two days of the semester. What is radioactive decay? And uh, this is a graph of it. This is another exponential function, but the base is E. E is a number, it's Euler's number, okay? Um, it was named after a very famous mathematician named Euler. It starts with a U, I mean an E. Um, it's like pi, it's a universal constant. <clears throat> it existed before people ever, ever discovered it. Uh, the ancient Mesopotamians, who were the people, the Babylonians, they knew about E. They didn't call it E, they probably called it something else, but they knew it was there. It's a number that's about 2.7, just like pi is a number that's about 3.14, but both of these have decimal expansions that go on forever and ever. We're going to be using E a lot, so you have to get used to it. Okay, but E is a number greater than 1, isn't it? So, e to the x, the graph of e to the x is going to look pretty much like the graph of 2 to the x. Starts out way down here, so close to the x-axis, you can't see the difference. And then it grows slowly until it gets to 0, 1 and then boom, grows like crazy. The same things are true of this as, uh, as of 2 to the x. The domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Over here as well, negative infinity to positive infinity. This is e to the negative x. So it's a mirror image across the y-axis. They are mirror images of each other across the y-axis. Um, I need to keep this down so you can see. All right, so there's the same domain, negative infinity to positive infinity same thing over here. Domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, same as here. The graph never actually touches the x-axis. So the range goes from parenthesis zero to infinity. Same here. All right, and this is one to one. Draw a horizontal line through any part of the graph and that horizontal line intersects the graph at only one point. Therefore, this graph passes the HLT, the horizontal line test. Same thing here. Horizontal line intersects the graph at only one point. Therefore, this is a one-to-one -one function. Why do we care? One-to-one -one functions have inverses. Very important. So this is one-to-one, -one, check. This is one-to-one, -one, check. They're the same. The only difference is that 
this is increasing on its entire domain, the graph of y equals e to the x, the function e to the x, is increasing on its entire domain, and the graph of y equals e to the negative x is decreasing on its entire domain. So let's go back to y equals 2 to the x and talk about its inverse. We're going to meet this next week, but I just want you to be prepared. Um, inverses, that is one-to-one -one functions have inverses, and those inverses are mirror images of the original function or of their mate across the line y equals x. So here is the inverse. These are inverses of each other. If f of x equals 2 to the x, f inverse of x is written in a way you're not used to log base 2 of x. That's the inverse. Notice that these things are true. The y-intercept of this graph is 0, 1. There is no y-intercept. But the x-intercept is one zero. This is precisely what you would expect. Remember that the do domain and range of inverse functions switch. So you've got the point zero one here, you've got the point one zero here. Here you've got a horizontal asymptote. Here, you've got a vertical asymptote. The y-axis is the vertical asymptote. Meaning that this graph will get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the, excuse me, to the y axis, but never touch it. Well, gosh, that means the domain then is zero infinity with a parenthesis around the zero because the y-axis is where x equals zero. In fact, that's what the equation is called of the y-axis. It's x equals zero. Since the graph never touches x equals zero, I have to use a parenthesis. Well, remember that the domain over here is negative infinity to positive infinity. The range over here, 
since the graph never touches the x-axis, the range is zero to infinity, just like the domain here. And because this graph goes down forever and up forever, up slowly forever, the range here is negative infinity to positive infinity. This is just the way it should be. The domain and the range switch. Ultimately cool. All right, so this is just a little bit of the background knowledge of exponential functions. Let's actually go to your homework and do some problems and talk about graphing exponential functions using transformations. So here's an ex uh, let me make it bigger, bigger, bigger. Here we have y equals 3 to the x. This is an exponential function. And we're being asked to find, let's see, to graph the equation on paper. Um, however, you get to choose the equation here. y equals 3 to the x looks just like y equals 2 to the x, almost. I mean, there's a difference in how close this part is to the y-axis, and there'll be minor, minor, minor differences in the y-coordinates of, of these, okay? But all, all exponential functions, that have a number greater than one as what we call the base and X as the um, um, exponent, duh, are gonna look like this. And they're going to go through the point zero one. So yeah, this is your answer. And that appears to be all they're asking you. Now, you can, of course, always graph these on a graphing calculator, but I much prefer, let me pull up a little blank paper here. Okay, why? Um, yep. Yep, yep, there we go. What we're dealing with here is just for a little bit. Now I have to go back down on this. Boom, there, that's pretty good. All right, what we're dealing with here in number one in your homework, is y, y and f of x are the same, equals negative 6 to the x minus 1. Now your basic function, basic function, is y equals 6 to the x which looks just like, almost just like, y equals two to the x. So, if that's the point one zero, then y equals six to the x is gonna start out here. And go up, 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 up. Okay, so 
Now, this with a negative in front, this flips this graph upside down. That is, it reflects it across the x-axis. So this is a reflection, a riffle, across the x-axis. And then this, a minus one at the end, is a vertical shift down one unit. So instead of being here at, whoops, that was zero one, bad me. This is zero one. This point, put it up here, is zero negative one because it got flipped. The graph got flipped. And then this is going to take it down one more unit to zero negative two. And now this is going to be the horizontal asymptote because it drops one. And it's going to look something like that. So when you choose your graph, we're going to have something that looks like either this, let's see, there we go. Now, I, I don't know if you can see the green, it's in green. Who would think to put a graph in green except me? Um, you've got this graph and you've got this graph, but notice that this graph is entirely below the x-axis, which is precisely what our graph would be. So this is the only correct answer. So notice here a way to cheat is to use your graphing calculator or, or, you can use this. Now the thing is, this is the argument of the function. Where the X is, is where the argument is. When you have a negative in front of the X, that means you're going to reflect across the Y axis. So let's take a look at this step by step. My great artwork. Okay, so y equals e to the x is your basic function. y equals e to the negative x is a reflection across, oops, across the y-axis a sideways reflection, if you like, a horizontal reflection, because everything up here in the argument, the argument is wherever the X is, and the X's deal with horizontal stuff. Okay, so what started out, okay, I give up. But you can see I tried, I tried. Okay. There. Okay, so y equals z to the x has a lot in common with y equals two to the x, three to the x, four to the x, five to the x, six to the x. This is y equals e to the x. And this is y equals e to the negative x. Whew. 
reflection across the y axis. Now, what else is happening here? Oops, and there's a plus two. So, y equals e to the negative x plus two. This is a, a vertical shift up two units. So if we're going one, two, woo, then this, now first, before we do anything else, y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote for y equals e to the x. This would get farther down, it would. However, now, if we're going up two units, then this is going to go up two units, and the ha is going to be one unit below. Or if that's y equals zero and you're going up two units, duh, it's going to be y equals two. Okay, so now here is the graph. Of this. So all we have to do. There it is. Cool, cool me, cool me. See, the difficult part, I mean, if you learned your transformations, the difficult part here is adapting to the argument of the function, the X stuff, the horizontal stuff, being up here in the air. It's just the way it is. And so here you go on, and I'm just going to talk you through this. Well, maybe I won't. Here's three. We've got f of x. Guess I'll try to be a grown up about this. f of x equals five to the negative x minus three. All right, the basic function, the BF, kind of like best friend, is y equals five to the x, which looks like this. But we've got five to the negative x. Which is going to look like that. And then we've got y equals five to the negative x minus three, so this goes down three units. Let's see, all right, so if this, if this were the x-axis, then what started out looking badly like that would go down three units. So one, two, three, Here's the horizontal asymptote. And one, two, three, there's the y. Drawn considerably better. The uh, y-intercept. Okay, and then you, you pick. Well, this is two, four, six, eight, ten. But it's going down. Um, there, I think that's it. Let's take a look at the others. 
Nah, those two definitely not. It's between A and B. Yay, okay. We will go on to the fun. Money. This is the most famous financial formula in the world and it affects all of us every day especially if you've ever had a savings account or um, a cd or an ira or a retirement fund anything that is interest bearing you'll be using this formula or a formula that's derived from this formula. Let's talk about the parts and then we're going to work some problems with it. A is called the accumulated amount, accrued after time. In other words, that's the money you make, the money you're gonna take. Let's just talk about a savings account. Uh, this is the money you're going to take out of the savings account after 10 years, after 20 years, after 30 years, with the understanding that you're not going to take any out before then. So I guess it's more like a CD. The principal, P, is the amount of money you put in the bank or in the account at the very beginning. T is time in years, so if you have money in the bank for half a year, that T becomes 0.5, one half. Everything is based on years when you're dealing with this financial formula. R is the interest rate written as a decimal. So you'll see how this works if you don't know how already. And N, is the number of compounding periods per year. That is the number of times a year that interest is calculated on the money in your account and then added back to the account so then there's more money in it. That's how money grows in interest-bearing accounts. So the number of times per year that interest is calculated would be important to you. Okay, so let's look at this problem. Take a drink of coffee. Suppose that $79,000 is invested at 5.5% interest compounded quarterly. Okay, so let's go over this. You put $79,000 in an interest bearing account. The interest rate written as a percent is 5.5. 5.5% is 5.5%. Compounded quarterly, how many quarters are in a dollar? Four. That means that the, your money is going to be compounded, Is go, interest is going to be calculated on your $79,000. Well, of course, it's going to keep growing, um, but uh, uh, four times a year. So N equals four in our formula. All right, now R is what you get when you change this 5.5% to a decimal. Here's how it works. You take 5.5 .5 
and you divide it by 100. You can do this in the calculator if you want. In, in when I was a kid, we just learned, OK, what you did, what what dividing by 100 does is it takes the decimal point and moves it two places to the left. So what you do is you take 5.5. And you do this boom, boom. And that gives you the decimal equivalent of 5.5%. However, 5.5 divided by 100 is 0 0.055. So either way. So now, a, it says find the function for the amount to which the investment grows after T years. That is, here's the general compound interest formula. We need to find the specific formula for this problem. So here we go. A equals 79,000 times 1 plus 0 0.055 over four raised to the four T power. Now in most books, this is good enough. However, in this book, you're asked to go to one more step before you enter your formula, and that is to calculate what that is in the parentheses. OK, we're going to do that. Uh, 1 plus 0 0.055 divided by 4. There it is. It's a terminating decimal. So we're allowed to write the whole thing. It's short enough so we can. That's the great thing about terminating decimals. You can write the whole thing. 1.01337 1 5 close parentheses raised to the 4 T. There you go. That is your formula that you're going to use. This is the answer to part A. This is the formula you use for part B. That is, find the amount of money in the account at T equals zero, that is in the beginning, T equals four after four years, T equals seven after seven years, T equals 10, or I should say not after seven years, at seven years, and T equals 10 at 10 years. So we're going to do that. So here's part B. We're going to have T equals zero. T equals four. T equals seven. And T equals 10. What you're going to notice is that the only thing that changes is T. All right, so if T is zero, you're going to have A equals 79,000 
times 1.01375. Raised to the four times zero. I have found for myself that when I see that, I want to hit a decimal point, even though it's a raised dot. So if I put this in parentheses, I'm going to hit the multiplication key. That's just for me. You find your own way. A equals 79,000 times 1.01375 raised to the 4 times 4. T equals 7. A equals 79,000 times 1.01375. 3, 7, 5 to the 4 times 7, and A equals 7, 9, 0, 0, 0, times 1 plus point, point zero one three seven five to the 4 times 10. Now, it stands to reason that this is easier if you go ahead and multiply these in advance. So you would have zero, you would have 16, you would have 28, you would have 40, but that's up to you. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to do the first one here. 79000, parentheses, 1.0. Zero one three seven five carrot four times zero. Now, if you have the older operating system, you're going to say carrot, there's going to be a parenthesis, I think. If not, put one in and then say four times zero and close your parenthesis. That's the only difference. OK, so over here I have 79,000, but let's go all the way back to the beginning and make sure I did this right. So seven, 79,000, yes. 1.01375, yes. Four times zero, yes. Here we go. <gasps> Who would have thunk it? Of course, T equals zero means in the beginning. That's all you have in the beginning. What's going on here is four times zero is zero. This number, 1.01375, is being raised to the zero power. When any number, if you raise it to the zero power is one. So 79,000 times one, is 79,000. Now I'm going to point out to you something that you probably know from experience. The more times you write or type that, the more likely you are to make a mistake. So to avoid that, notice that I went through and I double checked just to make sure that this is correct. I'm going to get a copy of that line by pushing, by clicking on zero. Uh, no, I'm not, I lied. By clicking on second, enter. That gives me a copy of what I just typed. All I need to change is that zero. I need to change it to a four. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit the back arrow key once, twice, 
Now my, my cursor is blinking on top of the zero, and I'm going to type four to overwrite the zero. Now it's four times four. Enter. That gives me nine, eight, two, nine, two point six, three, blah, 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 blah. Um, what the instructions say here underneath the answer boxes is to round this amount to the nearest whole dollar. That means you're rounding to a number to the left of the decimal point right here. So I need to check on the two. I move over one decimal point to the right. That's the six. This six is going to cause the two to round up to a three. So I'll have nine, eight, two, nine, three. That's how much money we'll have in this account after four, well, at four years. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Second, enter. I'm going to hit the, the left arrow key one, two times. And um, now I'm going to overwrite the time, which is four right now. I'm going to overwrite it to seven. That means I just, I don't have to delete the four. I just type seven. And now the four has turned into a seven. And that gives me one, one, five, seven, nine, five, point, four, blah, 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 blah. Uh, because the four is all that matters, this four will not cause the five to round up. So my answer is going to be one, 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 five, seven, nine, five. And finally, do this. I'm going to go second, enter again. Second, enter. Use the back arrow key. Boom, boom. Change the seven to a 10. Hit enter. One, three, six, four, one, four. Point eight, blah, blah, blah. The, the eight is all that matters. I don't have to round. The nine does not round the eight. All I do is I look at the eight. And it will cause the four to round up to a five. So my answer will be one, three, six, four, one, five. And that's how you work with this, clearly you're gonna to have to be using your calculator. So just force yourself. If you don't have a Texas Instruments calculator, I personally don't know how to use it, but any scientific calculator will let you do this. Um, just read the instructions or go to YouTube <clears throat> and uh, say, compound interest formula using whatever kind of calculator you have hit enter and i guarantee there will be um, videos showing you how to do it you can find out how to do anything on youtube change your oil change the sink faucet build a house it's incredible there are probably some bad things you could learn too, but you get what you look for. Okay, let us go on to Melissa. Melissa is on the final. So you wanna make sure 
that you know Melissa and you know what she's getting for her birthday. Drink a coffee. Okay, on Melissa's sixth birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. She gets a $6,000 CD that earns 7% interest compounded quarterly. This will not mean anything to a six-year-old. A six-year-old wants toys. However, by her 11th birthday, she may value it. Probably it's an uncle doing this. Anyway, she gets a, or an aunt, she gets a $6,000 CD earning 7% interest compounded quarterly. So there we are with four quarters and a dollar. Four, a quarterly means four, N equals four. So we are going to have P equals 6,000. Um, R equals 7 over 100, which is 0 0.07. And now T, this is designed to mess you up. The most common error working this problem is people let T equal 11, but it's not true. T is the time the money is in the bank. That starts on her sixth birthday. And then uh, it matures. That means she can take it out on her 11th birthday. Hopefully her parent or parents won't let her take it out, but keep it in longer. OK, so our time is going to be 11 minus 6. So that means the CD is in the in the bank or in wh whatever institution for only five years. All right, so here's our general formula, A equals P parentheses one plus R over N parentheses close to the NT. And then our specific formula is going to be A equals 6,000 paren one plus 0 0.07 over four raised to the four times five. So we're gonna find how much money is in the account in five years. Okay, so 6,000 parentheses, one plus 0 0.07 divided by four parentheses closed carrot four times five is 20 you can just say 20 but four times five enter and i get eight four oh here we're told to round to the nearest cent that means the way we usually round money the way we usually calculate money, I mean, it's going to be $8,488 point and that many cents. Okay, so we're going to be rounding to two decimal places. 8488.66, here are two decimal places. Now, one place beyond that is a nine, and the nine is going to cause the six to go up to a seven. So our answer is going to be $80,488.67. We could go on and find out how much she'll have if 
mom forces her to keep it in the bank and uh, take it out when she's ready to go to college, if she wants to go to college. But if we have time, maybe we'll do that. But let's go down here because there are things that you need to see. For, inst int uh, for instance, interest is compounded semi-annually. We haven't dealt with that. Semi-annually means two times a year. N equals two. All right, so the rest of this is given to you. P equals 4,000. The interest rate is going to be 4 over 100, which is 0 0.04. The time is three years, and N is two. You can even make a little column for that. Right there. Okay, so A equals P parentheses one plus R over N to the NT. That's the general compound interest formula. The specific compound interest formula for this problem is 4,000 parentheses one plus 0 0.04 over two, parentheses closed, raised to the NT, N is two, T is three. Which is six, don't tell anybody. Okay, 4,000. parentheses, one plus 0 0.04 divided by two. Raised to the two times three, I vote we say six. Now I can see the whole thing, you see. 4,000 parentheses, one plus 0 0.04 divided by two semi-annually. Oh, I said times. I am so glad I looked back. Divide. There. You see, you should check. I should check. All right, six really is two times three. That's an argument to keep it two times three. Enter. $4,504 and six, four, followed by a nine. This nine will cause the four to go up to a five. So we will have four, five, zero, four, point seven. D. No. Where did I get that? No. Someone stop me before I kill again. 65. There we go. Discussion. Okay. So now we know this. We know quarterly means n equals four. Now you've just learned about semi-annually. which means n equals two. And oh, by the way, annually.
is n equals one. Monthly, I bet you got that one. n equals 12, and daily, which we're about to do, daily, is 36, oh, n equals 365, not 365.25. Now, I don't know what banks really do, but in math books, 365. And there we have it. Daily. And we've got all the rest, right? T is five. Yes, we've got everything we need. A equals P parentheses one plus R over N to the N T, which will be 14,000 two, seven, three, parentheses, one plus point zero three five divided by three sixty five raised to the NT uh, three sixty five three no. 365 times 5. Uh, no, 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 not for me. 5. When you know you make a mistake or tend to change something. Clear. All right, here we go. 14273. Print one plus point zero three five divided by three sixty five parentheses closed raised to the three sixty five. times five. That's horrible. Okay. Now, ha, yeah, I'm going to check this again. One, four, two, seven, three. Check. Parentheses, one plus point zero three five. Yes. Divided by 365. the 365 times 5 power. Okay. Enter. Okay. 17,000 2 point five one four. And that six doesn't matter because here's what I want to round to, and this four will not cause the one to round up to a five. So one seven zero zero two and fifty one cents. the dollar sign will already be there for you. You don't have to write it. There's one more thing. There's something that you're going to learn. You haven't learned. called continuous compounding.
you'll know when you get there. You're not going to encounter this tonight, but I want you to know it's coming. That's a theoretical upper limit that you can use to figure out which account, which savings account, which CD would be the best for you. Um, continuous compounding is like every second of the day or night interest is calculated and added back into your account. Constantly, constantly, continuously. There's a different formula for that. A equals P, same P, times the number E to the R, T power. We're going to be working with that. But not yet. But you should see it and know it's coming. Now we've got one more problem here. And we've got time. And you're still going to get out early. Oh, don't tell anyone. Now that you've got A equals P parentheses one plus R over N parentheses close to the NT, now that you've got that thing, here's another formula, but you don't have to memorize this. This is just to show you that there are other exponential formulas. There are lots of other exponential formulas. Now, Here's a formula, the demand for lumber is increasing exponentially. That means it's going, going up, going through the roof. The demand for lumber. The number of, the amount of timber in, in billions of cubic feet consumed T years after 1997 can be approximated by that formula right there. N of T equals 73 parentheses 1.018 parentheses closed to the T. I don't I don't even know if that's a real formula, but it might be. Where T corresponds to 19 T equals zero corresponds to 1997. And this tells us how much lumber was consumed in 1998. Well, if T equals zero is 1997, then T equals one is going to be 1998. So that's cool. N of one, or N at one year, equals 73 times 1.018 to the one power, and that'll be uh, billions of cubic feet. I'm not sure consumed is really the right term. I think of eating when I hear about consumed, but actually consumers, yeah, I guess consumed is right. So 73 times 1.018. Eight. Now, 1.018 raised to the one power is 1.018, but if you're a little bit paranoid about it, go ahead and use the one. So that'll be 74.314. And notice that this says round to the nearest hundredth, 
that's two decimal places. Look at the four, the four will, will not, it won't cause anything to round up. So our answer in the answer box, if it would fit, 74.31 billion cubic feet. And this has been our so our sojourn into exponential functions. I recommend you try to get done with everything by the end of this weekend, because what we start on Monday is totally new, totally different, and will blow you away. Take that as a well-meant warning. Okay. My poor 1030 class is going to start it today. See you later. Unless you have questions, hang around if you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.